So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're very happy for this uh, 162nd um, workshop uh, of the you know, CPR um, CSH Urban Series to welcome today Matthew Edicula. Uh, Matthew is a um, legal and policy consultant and a visiting faculty at Azim Premji University in uh, Bangalore. And uh, he has done a lot of work about uh, planning, the role of law and politics, participation in planning. And this is going to be the subject of the talk today with a focus, if I understand, on uh, Delhi and uh, Bangalore today. So, uh, Matthew, you have about uh, 45 minutes and then we will take uh, questions. But um, the audience is, of course, very welcome to start you know, putting your questions in the chat box and uh, please unmute yourself uh, for the time uh, being. And um, yeah, Matthew, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Um, thanks, CPR, CPA, uh, CPH, uh, Mukta, and everybody else uh, for for, call, for inviting me, for calling me for this uh, for this webinar. I'm you know pleased to be here. Um, and uh, and thanks all of you for joining in uh, on a, on a on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, happy Onam to all those who are celebrating. Uh, when uh, when Stephanie mentioned Tuesday uh, of, of of one of the last months, I thought, okay, sounds good. I, I didn't actually think that it was coinciding with uh, Onam. So, but yeah, so it's it's a it's uh, it's a different Onam for me. And uh, uh, let's let's see how it goes. Uh, so yeah, so let's let's uh, let's get started. Um, the, the the topic for for the day is I'm trying to uh, sort of unpack the the nature of uh, urban planning law regimes that operates in Indian cities, uh, and of course through that get a sense of how urban planning informality and the law sort of uh, you know intersect with each other. Right. Um, that's the that's the overall frame. That's the overall objective. Um, if you can sort of just to give a sense of what the talk is is going to do. So. Um, it seeks to uh, unpack the character of urban planning regimes in India uh, through a close consideration of the evolution operation uh, of planning laws, uh, institutions, and processes that operate in Indian cities, particularly focusing on, uh, on Delhi and Bangalore. Um, and then sort of uh, this is attempted by asking uh, three major questions on to understand the nature of the planning law regime. First question is, uh, who has the authority to plan the city? Secondly, how participative is the planning process? And, and thirdly, how is the plan contested and implemented in the context of informality? So through, through these questions, the aim is to uh, uh, you know, highlight and understand uh, why the urban planning law regimes uh, operate the way they do. So for that, I trace the historic roots of uh, India's uh, you know, urban planning institutions um, and, and actually look at how the history of, of keeping uh, improvement, uh, urban planning and improvement det detached from local politics uh, continues to inform the planning systems as it uh, operates in India today, right? And finally, I sort of argue that um, what we have is a top-down uh, planning uh, process and it produces plans that speak very little to the reality of informality uh, that you see on the ground. And, and such a process, uh, such a planning regime actually allows, uh, enables the state uh, wide discretion, you know, to take action against illegal constructions or, or regularize, uh, uh, you know, uh, illegalities, uh, you know, through its own sort of techniques. So that's the broad frame and broad uh, argument uh, of, of today's uh, lecture. Just to give a context of how I've sort of got into it, uh, I was part of um, a, a comparative project looking at planning law regimes in Asian cities that was done at NUS uh, School of Law in Singapore. And uh, so I looked at the planning law regimes that operate in India, focus on Bangalore. This was about three, four years back. And then over the last couple of years, I've been engaged with, uh, with WIGO, uh, Women in Formal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, with a law program, looking at how planning laws uh, you know, impact uh, informal livelihood, uh, using the case of Delhi and to some extent Bangalore. So, so those are two projects that I've been part of, which looks at planning law systems and its 
and its impact. And there are a couple of papers that came out of out of uh, both these uh, projects. And uh, presently, I'm sort of uh, working on a third one, which sort of uh, brings these things together. And uh, this paper, this talk is a way to way for me to reflect on some of those ideas and maybe get um, some feedback and and you know uh, thoughts on how to take it forward. So all kinds of suggestions are welcome uh, on, on on that uh, in in the in the last Q and A section. Right. So how is how is the presentation structured? Firstly, um, we have, I mean, first there's a short introductory uh, you know, section. There are five sections to the, to the paper, to the talk. Uh, the first section is an introductory section, which looks at the relationship between urban planning, informality, and the law, tr trying to place this, uh, this, this paper within the broader literature on, on planning and informality and the law. Secondly, I trace the evolution of India's urban planning systems from colonial times to modern times. Uh, it's a sort of a, you know a historical trajectory of, of the evolution and what it means. Thirdly, the the meat of it is the planning law framework of Delhi and Bangalore through the three questions I already identified: the authority to plan, the process of planning, and plan implementation and violations. Uh, you know how that operates within the planning law frameworks. And uh, fourthly, very quick uh, discussion on the draft master plan of Delhi and how it discusses and deals with questions of informality. And finally, a reflection on the scope and limits of uh, India's urban planning law regime. Um, of course, I don't know how much time we'll have to discuss that in detail, but I think that can sort of uh, nicely lead to a Q&A, which, which might help us understand uh, what are the scope and limits and possibilities for future of what a planning law regime can look like. So that's broadly the structure of, of today's uh, engagement. Um, just moving forward, the first part itself, that is urban planning, informality, and the law. Urban planning itself, there's been, of course, a lot of writing, and the links between urban planning and informality has been, uh, is, you know, this, this, the literature on it is, is wide, from, from Anania Roy to Solly Benjamin to so many others who've been looking at the relationship between planning, urban planning and informality. But uh, what, what we don't see much in, in that literature is possibly because of the nature of of, of planning, how it operates regarding the informal nature in which it operates. The legal and institutional framework of planning um, on the planning law systems, how it operates, there's not been much, much focus, much literature on this, especially in India. Um, also the informality, urban informality literature is mostly focused on spatial informality, informality of housing. Uh, it does not link so much around informality of work, informality of labor, right? So the, there are these, you know, I would say some gaps within within the framework. So the attempt is to look at, but the, the links are very very you know uh, very obvious, right? So because the informality and the actual planning law framework, uh, the planning law framework might actually constitute the informality that exists. So hence it's important to look at the planning law framework. And similarly, if you look at informal housing versus uh, versus work, uh, there also it's intimately connected. People who are working in formal labors, uh, you know, are people who tend to stay in informal housing. And those housing is often uh, not just a place for residence, but also a place for work. Hence, the connections between, um, you know, urban planning, uh, planning law, uh, informality of housing, informality of work, all of this is, is sort of uh, interestingly connected, but maybe not focused enough. And uh, the attempt is to look at all of them in a, in a sort of overarching way. In, in this paper. So as I mentioned, planning law itself, actually it's it's a highly understudied uh, uh, field within within law itself, within among law, uh, legal scholars also, the questions around urban planning is hardly looked at. So um, the the pioneering work on this is is by the late Patrick, Patrick McCallson, who passed away just about two, three years back, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Uh, his uh, famous book is The Ideologies of Planning Law. This came out in 1980, right? Um, and so it's whatever, 45, 50 years since, since that frame has been used. And after that, there's not been any major book length, you know, uh, you know, examination of how planning law systems operate, you know? So, and obviously things have changed quite a bit since then. Uh, mm -hmm. Even then, even broadly, globally, even in the global North, uh, the focus has been a, a bit low on this on this field. So the idea, the ideologies of planning law, if you look at uh, McCallson, he says that planning law systems in, in various countries uh, can adopt, are usually driven by, you know, three competing ideologies. One is the ideology of pro pro private property, 
always trying to protect the property rights of, of individuals. The, the other is the ideology of public interest, whereas the state plays a dominant role in, in, in promoting the public interest as the main way of uh, driving urban, urban planning. And thirdly, the ideology of public participation, where uh, where people have a dominant or important role in in the in way in the way planning systems are uh, are, are designed and and plans are made. So, and and his study was this book is mostly set up uh, uh, in the context of UK uh, and uh, the the sort of overall uh, claim was that the uh, public participation part is mostly the weakest and mostly planning law systems operate as a you know competing interest between private prop property and public interest you know uh, that was the that was a co co finding of course this is 1980 things have evolved quite a bit after that uh, we know how public participation has become uh, a, a co component of many planning laws globally but uh, we'll see how it operates in the indian context it may not have changed as much you know as uh, as, as was sort of discussed um, uh, in in uh, patrick McCallson's uh, pioneering work so in the Indian context, you don't have too much uh, writing which looks at planning law frameworks, but there are, there's of course a, a ton of literature on planning and informality and its links with law. Much of it has been on uh, law informality and its connection with evictions and demolitions. You know, there's quite a bit of uh, literature there. I'm sure many of you have seen the books which are indicated here by Gautam Ban, by Anuj Bhuvania, by Asha Gartner, all of them studying you know, a particular period of time, you know, in Delhi, uh, when, when, uh, when people used the law the, uh, and the courts, uh, uh, you know, and the courts became an organ, uh, a, a slum demolition machine, as Bhuvne calls it, right? Um, uh, when, when the law was sort of mobilized by, uh, say, resident welfare associations who were unhappy with the way say certain informal settlements and slums used to operate, how they use the court and the law to, to channel demolitions, to channel evictions, uh, you know, in early, early years, so early 2000s and, you know, almost uh, leading them all the way to 2010s and 2012s, right? So, so that is uh, a literature that is dominantly there. And I think, uh, you know, all the three books are obviously very useful and uh, helping us understand uh, and helping me also understand some of these things. But, Again, it it does not really look into the planning law frameworks and the institutional processes, uh, you know, in in much detail. Uh, so so that is the context in which uh, this paper is uh, sort of uh, situated in. Now, getting on to the second section, which is looking at the evolution of India's urban planning system. Right. So very interestingly, if you see here, this is uh, this is the late eighteen nineties uh, in Bombay. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the disinfect, disinfecting sprays being carried out. Some memory, some of this is being repeated in other ways. When COVID was it was at play, we had, uh, I mean, honestly, unscientific ways of again disinfection going, uh, you know, going on in the cities and the municipal corporation. Some of them actually carrying it out. I mean, the the point here is that. Uh, if you look at planning institutions, you know, I'm sure many of you are already aware of this, but so it might be a repetition for them. Planning institutions actually came in, came into being as a response to the plague, as the response to the bubonic plague that struck Bombay in 1896. 6% of the population of the city was wiped out, right, in, in this uh, tragic event. And um, till then, uh, the British uh, colonial system was mostly concerned with only governing and administering you know, its own backyard, right? That is the cantonment and the civil lines, you know? It, so there used to be clear division between the white town and the black town, so-called. And the cantonment was controlled by, by, the, by the British, but they did not, you know, want to interfere too much uh, with what was happening, you know, in, 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 in where the natives lived, the native part of the town. But it was, it was felt that the plague originated from the native parts. Uh, because of quote unquote uh, unsanitary conditions in which uh, the natives lived, uh, and hence you need an intervention because the plague originated there and it's actually coming out to the cantonment parts and affecting the British. So you need to actually have a new approach, and that's when the idea of uh, looking at the city as a whole uh, came about. And um, the Bombay Improvement Trust was set up uh, in 1898, uh, and um, 
this obviously had a major role in it to play. Um, the one of the focus areas was about decongestion because congestion was seen as the biggest problem and as a way in which uh, the plague was spreading because of congestion and unhygienic sort of uh, living. So, so the the improvement trust, the Bombay Improvement Trust, you can see the picture of the of the building there. The improvement trust was uh, given eminent domain, right? Eminent domain powers, powers to demolish and acquire property, right? And um, it 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 was asked to sort of decongest and and carry out, uh, you know, sort of you know rebuilding the city, uh, including the native parts, uh, you know, in in a substantive way. And you you can see the history and of it uh, play out in in multiple ways, uh, you know, including including currently. Now. So this started off with Bombay, with the Bombay Improvement Trust, and you see that it continuing uh, to various other cities. You have Improvement Trust being created, uh, you know, across uh, across uh, presidency towns and other areas that the British controlled. You had uh, it emerging in, in in Calcutta, in in um, in Madras, uh, and uh, in, in in the cities in in United Provinces, Lucknow, Kanpur, uh, Bangalore at, at a later point, Delhi also. All of these, of course, uh, Delhi, Bangalore came at a later point, whereas some of the other cities uh, it, it emerged earlier. Um, so, so uh, what is interesting, for example, the Delhi's Improvement Trust was, uh, you know, set up in 1937. Uh, interestingly enough, it was, it was chaired by A. P. Hume, uh, who was actually influenced by the principles of Patrick Giddes and um, supported the idea of conservative surgery. You know, I'm sure there are so many planners in the room who are familiar with uh, Geddes' work and um, his idea of conservative surgery, so I won't get into the details of it, but that as opposed to demolition, right? Demolition and rebuilding, uh, you know, making small in, in, in incursions in the city and, and trying to build through that, right? So that was the idea. So uh, that was the Delhi Improvement Trust, uh, you know, so that's a picture of, of the trust taken in 1940, uh, and similar trusts operated across India. Now, what is why 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 do why why should we understand this right? It's because these improvement trusts leave a, a major post-colonial legacy, right? Um, now, the logic of uh, logic behind creating these improvement trusts were to keep uh, urban planning and improvement away from local politics, right? If you look at it. Municipal corporations were already set up by that time. I mean, we are not independent, but we had municipal corporations, which uh, you know, which were partly elected, you know, and in fact, many of our you know independence uh, leaders were part of municipal corporations, from Nehru to Patel to Bose to others, you know, all of them were part of municipal corporations, where you know, cut the teeth in municipal politics. Uh, but municipal corporations operated with part, you know, with partly elected members. They wanted improvement trust to be, you know, a set of experts and officials who are, you know, as as I think Pato Datta speaks in the context of Calcutta, who are unencumbered by the accountability to representatives of local self-governing institutions. So that division between, uh, you know, uh, democratic accountability and expert planning and improvement was set then. Now the the the, the legacy it leads is that. Most of these improvement trusts imposed in independent India transformed into development authorities, right? So almost all the improvement trusts that were there later were rechristened and reset, reset as development authorities. And this schism between uh, municipal corporation and the uh, and uh, the elected municipal corporation and the uh, unelected bureaucratic development authorities that that still continues, right? So that's that's the sort of uh, you know key uh, you know thing to learn from 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 that past experience. In terms of planning laws per se, if you look at it, the first major legislation that came in uh, for planning is the uh, Bombay Town Planning Act of 1915. This was modeled on the Housing and Town Planning Act of 99 uh, uh, that was there in UK, which itself was uh, based on the Garden City movement that uh, you know Ebenezer Howard had sort of uh, you know. Favored, right? So if you look at those three magnets, this town, country, and town country as three, you know, in you know, spaces which which need to be uh, separated in many ways. The idea was to go beyond the congestion and have a slightly more spread out way of urban planning and looking at town and country together. So, so that was a planning framework, very much inspired by that house and housing and towning uh, housing and town planning act of 99. 
actually uh, in UK that 99 Act was sort of overthrown by the 1947 Act, Town and Country Planning Act of 1947. Interestingly enough, 1947, this act is made uh, and India also gains independence, you know, at the same time, of course, unconnectedly. Um, and then it, uh, in, in Bombay, uh, the, town in, the, the Town and Country Planning Act is replaced. The old act of uh, 1915 is replaced by a new act of 1954, which is based on the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947. Now, what is what is the big change that you see in, in these legislations, right? So the old legislation were, was focused on town planning schemes, right? Which was not looking at master planning of the comprehensive planning across the city. Was you know, uh, if you're familiar with town planning schemes, it's for smaller areas where uh, there's land readjustment and, uh, and and planning schemes carried out. Um, that was what was there in the Bombay Town Planning Act of 1915, as well as Housing and uh, Town Planning Act of 1909. Whereas these were replaced in, in the UK by a Town and Country Planning Act regime, which spoke about the city as a whole and, and introduced uh, you know, planning systems for, for the whole city through the development planning or a, a master planning sort of regime. Right? So that's the big change that, uh, that occurred. Um, uh, of course, interestingly enough, the Bombay Act uh, kept some of the town planning uh, scheme provisions. And similarly, you see the uh, impact of that, of course, in Gujarat and others. We may not have time to get into how these operated, but the TPS schemes were actually retained in some ways uh, in some of the planning laws. But the development planning, comprehensive master planning regime in through law came in uh, in 1954 in Bombay. And then similarly, that became the basis for forming the Model Town and Country Planning Act of 1960. This was made by the Town and Country Planning Organization uh, in Delhi. And, and this was a model law because, of course, the union cannot make laws on the subject. And this model law was circulated across uh, across all the states uh, in India. And, uh, and you see that different states actually adopted, uh, you know, the, they, they devised their planning law based on this model Town and Country Planning Law of 1960 that was, that was made. Uh, and so if you, if you look at, so if you're getting to the cities that we're focusing on today, look at Bangalore. Bangalore is, is governed by the Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act of 1961, which is based on the model law of 1960, right? Uh, which itself is based on the 1947 uh, British legislation. And if you look at planning laws, the, the planning laws in most uh, states in India are all called Town and Country Planning Acts, state, the state's Town and Country Planning Acts. Most of them, uh, I've not had a chance to study all of them in detail, but most of them follow that similar sort of system. It is mostly centered around the master plan or a development plan, or, you know, or a, or a comprehensive plan. I mean, the term varies, but it's mostly centered around a master plan, which is a land use document, which will determine how the city is structured. And, um, and, and that sort of came in with the Town and Country Planning Act. So that's the historic basis of it. Delhi, for example, has a slightly different history because it, it does not have a town and country planning act. It has because it's it's, a, it's not a state, doesn't have a town and country planning sort of framework there. So you have what is instead you have a Delhi Development Act, which set up the Delhi Development Authority, which was but still followed a master planning regime, right? It was supposed to prepare the master plan of Delhi. And uh, it the history there is slightly different because it was also it was a, it was seen as a response to the you know crisis of refugees coming in, as well as a jaundice epidemic that, that struck Delhi uh, in 1956. So slightly different history and slightly different legal framework uh, and a unique framework that came in Delhi. And the Delhi Development Authority is the first development authority of its kind that was set up. And, and similar copycat development authorities were later set up for many other cities uh, you know, in India, uh, including Bangalore and including most of the cities that, that most of the metropolitan cities at least we, we are aware of, right? So that is the history. There's a town and country planning history. And then there's a development uh, which itself, you know, we can trace back. Then there's a CITB, the City Improvement Trust Board history, which transformed itself into, uh, in, into you know, development authorities. And of course, the development authorities then continue to exist and play a major role uh, in how uh, urban planning operates in India, right? Now, coming on to the third topic the, uh, of, of today, which is looking at the planning law framework and you know who are the key uh, you know, players in the system. The first question is, of course, about who plans the city. So starting off, I'm, I'm looking at who should plan the city, 
right? Not in a sort of normative uh, framework where I'm coming up with, you know, uh, you know, uh, without looking at the legal framework, but in a legal normative framework. If you look at the early 90s, there was a major reform that I'm sure most of you are aware of it. The 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments were introduced. If you look at those amendments, you know, the aim of those amendments were to empower, you know, panchayats and municipalities uh, to work as institutions of self-government. Um, under this scheme, and I mean, under for, for, for this purpose, um, municipalities were, uh, were given uh, powers to prepare and implement plans for development and social justice. And it was also given, it was made responsible for a bunch of subjects, um, this 18 subjects listed in what is called the 12th schedule of the constitution, right? This is 1992, 74th amendment. What is most interesting here is that if you look at the 12th schedule of the constitution, the first three subjects, uh, you know, in the first in the twelfth schedule, are all planning subjects: urban planning, regulation of land and use, and planning for economic and social development. So all of these planning functions were vested, or at least ought supposed to be vested, uh, in the local government, in the municipal corporation, under the constitutional framework. The constitution also provided for. Uh, metropolitan planning committees for cities with over 1 million population and district planning committees for all other cities. These were supposed to operate at a, at a higher scale, which is above the city government, which is supposed to, at a regional scale, uh, prepare a development plan for the whole region, right? So, it, so to, to summarize, what the 74th did is it created municipal corporations, it mandated the constitution of municipal corporations, it vested them with more powers and asked the state to best 18 functions to to these municipal corporations three of them the top three being planning functions so municipal corporations were expected to plan and secondly it also created an, another institutional uh, you know arrangement over the city at the metropolitan level or at the district level in non-metropolitan context uh, to have a metropolitan or district planning committee to plan for the region so that's the odd question that's what the constitutional framework uh, frame, I mean, not the constitutional frameworks, but the constitutional amendment frameworks uh, sort of envisioned for, for you know, for this, uh, for, for India. But how does this play out in reality, right? Obviously, uh, this is not translated in the way it sort of, it was thought to, um, uh, and, and it of course varies from city to city, but let me just, I mean, I, here we are looking Delhi and Bangalore, but overall, if you look at it, Bombay being an exception where the municipal corporation still actually is re uh, responsible for preparing the development plan. Otherwise, planning still seems to have not been taken away from the development authority and put to the hands of municipal corporation. It's hardly happened uh, even after the promise of the 74th Amendment. And I would say that's the major uh, failing of whatever you want to call it of, of the amendment or of the political forces that were in charge of implementing the amendment. Um, so how does it operate in Delhi and how does it operate in Bangalore? So in Delhi, you, as you can see, the three institutions that I pointed out there, the Municipal Corporation of Delhi really has no, no role to play in planning. This is the Delhi Development Authority, which is vested, which has always been vested and continues to plan, uh, responsible for preparing the master plan. The Delhi Development Authority is controlled by the government of India, as you can see, and not the government of NCT of Delhi, right? That is, of course, because of uh, the unique character of Delhi, because land is a subject which is kept away from the government of National Capital Territory of Delhi, and it is vested in the union government. Hence, the union controls the DDA and not the state. So the state government and municipal corporation really don't have much role to play in planning. It is, it is almost always the Delhi Development Authority, which is controlled by the union government, which plans. So not a local authority, a development authority controlled by the union government, which, which plans. Bangalore is slightly different uh, because of it's a, it's under a state and not a union territory with union characteristics. Uh, so Bangalore also, it is the, the municipal corporation, the, the BBMP, that's the first image there, uh, really does not have you know any major role in planning other than implementation of plans. Uh, the, the Bangalore Development Authority is responsible for planning and the government of, government of Karnataka, so the state, controls uh, you know uh, sort of the de the bangalore development authority now, this obviously raises uh, bigger questions because uh, in 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 bangalore's case there's no real question of uh, you know uh, i mean in delhi's case there's no real question of can the municipal corporation play a role and you know can uh, can the state government play a role in in planning because uh, because land is anyway not 
you know a subject that is under their purview but that doesn't apply for you know normal states like karnataka so you can actually notice that uh, there's been a lot of agitation against this uh, people have gone to court to challenge uh, you know the uh, the very existence of, of the bangalore development authority in fact in one of the cases in the karnataka high court the karnataka high court said that after the 74th amendment the bangalore development authority does not have any right to exist you should disband yourself you should not exist anymore and it or it gave that order of course that was challenged in the supreme court the court the supreme court interestingly in this famous bondu ramaswamy case held that uh, well the functions of a development authority and the functions of a municipal, municipal corporation are different um and both of them have different roles so both of them can exist um so in that way the <laughs> bangalore development authority still continues to exist but the key question about uh, who should you know does the bda have the power to plan for the city that was not addressed by the court because it was about whether the bda bda could acquire a piece of land and hence whether the bda itself uh, deserves to exist anymore that was the question not whether the bda can actually make the plan that question has actually been you know uh, some of some of the people i know have now filed a case uh, in the canada high court uh, you know challenging the right of bda to make the plan and it's it's still pending uh, that is because the plan itself is, is pending plan was made and scrapped i don't want to get into details of it so the question of can development development authorities plan has not been conclusively answered though the existence of development authority is seen as constitutional whether their whether their ability or the legal authority to plan is not being you know just to suffice it to say it's not been finalized it's still a open legal question with a real case at hand right uh so so that's the first question around you know uh, who should plan second is about the process of planning how participative as i said how participative is is the is the planning process uh not surprisingly uh, it's not very participative under the under the law um there are very few provisions under the planning law which which uh, provides for any kind of participatory participatory uh, mechanisms um it has a standard sort of uh, provision which say a draft plan should be made it should be published uh, it, uh people should be able to make comments and objections and suggestions and then the the dda or the you know the authority in its own infinite wisdom can consider the, those suggestions and adopt them or not adopt this the in this delhi's case the union government the central government can also make modifications so it's a very sort of generic provisions where uh, where it mostly allows uh, only you know a very limited Uh, engagement for public to participate in the planning process uh, there are a couple of provisions in in the in the delhi development act uh, actually which is not not too bad in terms of uh, the planning uh, in in terms of participation one is it allows the secretary it enables the secretary to do all kinds of uh, measures uh, including you know announcement through the beat of drum and others you know to make sure that the uh, the notices about planning uh, you know provisions are are known to the people right it's about building awareness so it enables to enables the secretary of dda to do that doesn't mandate enables them to do that and secondly it also has a fairly detailed provisions in the rules on the board of inquiry and hearing where uh, physical you know uh, physically you can you know representations objections and suggestions can be made right uh, uh, before the dda about changes that should be made uh, to the draft plan right uh, similar provisions that govern bangalore um you know uh, draft plan is made suggestions are made you know suggestions can be made by people the modifications again government can consider it's always consider right government can consider those suggestions and uh, can adopt whatever suggestion and then final plan is notified so the process is again not uh, does not involve the people in any substantive way in you know in, in this you know doesn't mandate that so what we have is informing the people and soliciting comments it is not a uh, participation engagement or any kind of consultation uh, you know those those forms are not there in the law right we'll we'll see how it actually plays out how some of these things have emerged uh, you know in a in a different way right so so that's that and finally the most important question is around how how does all of this translate right now the plan the plan is there's a planning authority plan make uh, which makes a plan process and then there's a the implementation framework and as all of us you know are familiar with it the usual challenges around uh, challenge or whatever you want to call it is around the implementation framework right so um uh 
at one level, the law makes it very clear. Uh, the Delhi Development Authority makes uh, Delhi Development Act makes it very clear that uh, all developments, all kinds of uh, developments that happen in the city should be as per the plan. If it is inconsistent with the plan, the you know, you know the the authority or the, the government has a right to to set it right, right? Which is what we see in in various ways. But as all of us are aware, much of what the plan states and what we see on the ground is huge divergence. Um, and there's no real implementation framework in the law. So the if you look at town planning acts across and including the Delhi Development Act and the Bangalore Kannada Town and Country Planning Act, there's no real implementation framework other than to say that the the the, uh, the, the all development should be as per plan. There's no real framework around how to you know monitor and implement. Interestingly, the draft uh, master plan for Delhi of 2041 provides for a new implementation framework in a not a legislative framework. It is a planning framework. It is, speaks about setting up a plan monitoring unit and all of that. We'll see how that plays out. But otherwise, you don't have much of a framework. So what we see is that. Uh, you have a plan that is made and you have obviously the plan which is made is often notified much later and between the time the plan is made and it's notified so many changes would have already occurred and then we see that uh, you know much of what we see on the ground is so different from what is stated in the plan and then uh, you know it's city after city state after state you see what are called as regularization schemes which are carried out um, so uh, in Delhi, for example, since the 70s, there have been multiple waves of regularization schemes that were carried out to uh, to condone the while to, to condone the violations of planning that has been carried out through the payment of what is called a conversion charge. So multiple rounds have been carried out that has been challenged. In Bangalore, too, you see this big divergence between you know what is planned and what is on the ground. And here also there have been attempts to create what is called a, a new law called Akrama Sakrama. Which basically means uh, uh, legalizing the illegal or you know regularizing the irregular, um, and and this law has been again as quite this law it amends the uh, Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act in substantive ways, and gives uh, you know a whole set of uh, exceptions to, uh, to to the to, to the to the law, right? And now this law was again challenged. Uh, the constitutionality of this law was again challenged before the Kannada High Court and later in the, in the in the Supreme Court. The High Court actually allowed the law to exist, but the Supreme Court has stayed the law, which means that uh, the law is not operational now and all of it is under a cloud. Um, so, so so that's the that's the situation. So if you see on the right hand side, uh, this is about the diverse in this reality, how how do people claim their rights over spaces, right? So on the right hand side you can see what is called the application for regularization on unauthorized, you know, uh, you know, properties, right? So this is the under the Akrama Sakrama scheme. Thousands of people actually applied for it, but now it is uncertain because you know we don't know what will happen. Uh, whether the you know yeah, because the, the the scheme the whole law has been stayed by the Supreme Court. Um, so that's one way of you know regularizing your claim over. Uh, over 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 the spaces that you that you live at, uh, that's one. The other, if you look at on on your left hand side, you see uh, what is called as a Form B property register extract. Right, this is again a very interesting tool by which people make claims over spaces. Right, so uh, of course, as most of you are aware, we don't have a uh, we have a, a presumptive titling regime in India, so you don't really have you know title sort of clearly laid out and and then we have all forms of uh, documentary type uh, documentary forms that are used as uh, as some form of evidence over uh, over your right over a space now the paying of property tax the payment of property tax your existence in the register and the receipt of your uh, payment of property tax is is often a uh, you know is use is used as a way to claim your uh, right over that space now, what as we discussed, much of uh, urban development in Karnataka and in Bangalore is violating those uh, norms. So, building norms that are planning norms that are uh, what are called, you know, occupancy certificate that are, uh, uh, you know, approved building plans. M many of our, obviously, most of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, constructions don't abide by it. So, technically, the the government is not supposed to, you know, allow this to exist, but. But the corporation is still interested in collecting the tax. 
because you know that's the only source of revenue. If you don't collect taxes from property tax from the people who uh, sort of uh, operate in these sort of layouts, so you, you you I don't know how how the corporation can exist. So hence, you actually the what the corporation does it collects the tax but puts it in a different register called the B register. So you have what is called as A Kata and B Kata. A Kata is like, you know, mostly formal and everything is mostly fine. And the B Kata are properties which have some problems, you know, quote unquote, I'm oversimplifying this, the, the issue here, but the tax is still collected, but you are at a, sort of a second class in terms of your title or your claim over the spaces is not guaranteed, right? So that's the, that's the nature of how this is done, right? So these are the diversity of property claims. Now, given this context of not having, you know, this divergence between what is in the plan versus what you have, the state, as I mentioned, has wide discretion to do what it wants, right? If it feels, uh, yeah, you know, if it feels there is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, if, if it feels that uh, it, it wants to take action against against some buildings uh, at certain points of times, for example, those Bangalore flooding a couple of years back, the, the city was under floods. It, the state decided it wants to show that it's doing something. So it would actually go out and demolish properties, right? So, and because the title and the kind of this, most of the properties are quote unquote illegal, it's easy to do it, right? And of course, now we see a different regime of bulldozer Raj coming in. I don't want to mix that with what, what is happening here because that is a much more insidious process. It's a political process targeting minorities and you know, as a form of retributive violence, as a form of collective punishment. That I would say is, is of course partly to do the do with this, but I would say the explanatory frameworks for that is very different. So I don't want to you know get into that today. Uh, here we see this actually happening across. It's not just the retributive bulldozer Raj, as, as this figure from uh, HLRN shows. 1,30,000 people in, uh, of, were evicted in Delhi in uh, 2021. So only 619 in Bangalore in the same period, but still this seems to be quite uh, you know, prominently happening, right? So moving forward quickly uh, on the master plan of Delhi and how it deals with informality, I'll just have about, I think about five, six minutes left. So I'll just uh, you know go through this uh, a bit fast. Um, so very quickly, the, the, the master planning regime is on, in process now. Of course, it's... The plan has been uh, the draft plan has been released, and the final plan has not been approved, as many of you are aware. Um, now, how does this? How do the planning documents deal with the questions of informality? Do they even, you know, consider the reality of informality on the ground? So, interestingly enough, if you look at the Delhi Master Plan, the draft Master Plan, to the uh, Volume One, which deals with uh, enabling policy framework at many points refers to you know the reality of you know informal economy and informal you know uh, work and all of that to some extent there is some progress there but if you look at uh, volume 2 which i think is more of important which deals with the action plan and the development control norms those are still the same old very restrictive norms uh, uh, that uh, views much of uh, informality and um, informal work and you know uh, all of that with its own sort of prejudice you know lens uh, and if you look at it uh, more specifically like, on, on informal work as well as informal housing for example it really does not uh, consider with the town planning uh, uh, sorry the town vending committees which create uh, plans for street vending as a component of the master plan so it has it does not really incorporate street vendors and street vending act under the under the master plan regime it seeks to have its own regime of what can be done and what cannot be done and does not say a for for in case of street street vendors it should be as per the town town you know town vending committees though you know as i've realized the town vending committees are now been established uh, it really does not have a play uh, role play a role within the planning law framework or the plan itself in the case of delhi similarly if you look at informal housing there again some some uh, sort of uh, recognition of the reality uh, uh, you know around um, um, around how uh, around informality in the city so you see that um, uh, you see that they have provided for what are called as regeneration uh, programs and schemes for existing unplanned residential areas again it's a step up i think to how plans viewed uh, you know informal developments but again this sort of regeneration schemes these are only applicable for unauthorized colonies and urban villages it's not applicable for slums and jogi jobri you know clusters 
So for, for slums and JJ clusters, it's still the in-situ slum rehabilitation scheme, which is under PMAY, which is, which I'm not, I don't want to get into the details there. Of course, I'm sure most of you are, many of you are aware of the problems that that regime sort of presents. So, so that's the, that's the overall context and that's the, you know, that's how it, it operates and our plans kind of seem to continue to, you know, uh, marginalize uh, questions of informality. So, so, so I'm in the last part on the conclusion part on uh, what I said as uh, scope and limits of, of the planning uh, law regime that we have. Um, so just take everything about three, three, four minutes to uh, two, three minutes to bind this up. Uh, so, so given everything that we have discussed, uh, you know, what, what, how do we make sense of this planning, planning law regime uh, that, that exists uh, in India, right? So one core thing we, we see as, 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 a, as a dominant feature is firstly the disjuncture, right? The disjuncture between the authority to plan and local democratic, you know, accountability. And uh, which obviously emerges from this idea of improvement being kept away from elected municipalities that still continues and animates how uh, you know, urban development operates uh, in the city. The 74th constitutional amendment provided a different vision in my view, but it could not, and I'm saying it could not dismantle the bureaucratic structures that were, you know, that have developed over time, over the last hundred years, maybe not hundred, over the last, uh, you know, uh, yeah, if you look at many, many city improvement trusts, it's developed over the last hundred years. The bureaucratic structures which have got, you know, which have gathered power uh, through development authorities, it hasn't been able to unpack or unshackle or dismantle those regimes. Right. So, so in in those ways, these, uh, you know, because of those reasons, the, these disjunctures exist. So that's one thing. On on the questions around the authority to plan and and you know and those kind of questions. Secondly, on the participation question, as we see, we're still governed by what is a town and country planning regime of 1947. It where there's no real, you know, participatory, you know, mechanism provided. Uh, if you look at the Patrick McCallson framework, the ideology of public participation is the weakest, you know, within all the frameworks that we have. It is just that of informing, it's not of consultation or participation. That's not the framework. But even despite all that, you see. There have been efforts from below, efforts which have challenged these uh, these frameworks, which have emerged from the ground, or which have emerged from people saying that, hey, despite all this, we still want to engage with, with the planning process. Of course, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware and or maybe have been part of this has been the maybe the Lee campaign in Delhi it's brought many people together and engaged with the planning process at multiple levels, you know, engaged with the DDA and the NIUA at multiple levels, formally and otherwise. And then, of course, even you know, from what I understand, filed twenty-five thousand uh, you know objections to the DDA to their uh, you know draft master plan. And of course, there have been other endeavors. Bombay, for example, I'm sure some of you might be familiar. There was that whole movement about scrap the plan, you know, that was there in Bangalore. Similarly, the last plan was a huge civil society movement against it, uh, which is again I would say more confrontational than engage engagement. So, asking the plan itself to be scrapped, or in Bangalore's case asking the question, who are you to plan? You should not plan, you should disband, right? So, so the, you have these sort of uh, endeavors emerging from, from people, um, but all of this points out to the limits of the master planning regime of limits of using master plan as the key tool for, uh, for, for, you know, for urban planning in India when much of, uh, much of the world has moved beyond it. So just to sort of uh, conclude, it's obviously uh, time for us to rethink uh, these planning frameworks that we have. Um, uh, Top-down planning exercises, you know, which are all about, you know, imposing strict regulations uh, upon, upon, you know, uh, upon an informal kind of setup is bound to fail and possibly is designed to fail. Uh, so, and we need to look at other frameworks, other ways of looking at uh, planning. So instead of imposing positivist model of how uh, an ideal city should look at, we should obviously embrace ideas where, uh, you know, planning emerges from an understanding of the lived experience of, uh, of, of people. Now, what that is, how it can be done, you know, what should be, I don't have uh, answer. I, at least in this talk, I don't want to give those answers away or give, a, you know, a suggestions about what should be done. Uh, which are all framed as questions. So I started with questions and I'm ending with some questions, which possibly we can, you know, there might be answers to it during the question and answer session. 
So just broad questions around, you know, if if this pre, if this is the planning law regime that exists now, how do we have a possibly a different regime which which actually allows democracy uh, and and you know uh, is is more in tune with the uh, with the spirit of the seventy fourth amendment? Uh, what do we do with these development authorities and what do we do with the town and country planning uh, directorates, right? What is the role they should play? That's one broad question. The first two are that broad question. Second question, can law play a role, you know, in, in, in creating a participatory forum for planning, right? Uh, creating participatory processes for planning. Should law play a role? Can it play a role? Or can, will it have a possibly a negative effect because if you have if you create uh, invited spaces in the law you know there's always the uh, this fear of elite capture so will that have operate what should uh, what should that be fourth question um you know um if if this is if this is the if if you know illegality on the ground is a reality or informality on the ground is a reality should the regularization schemes that we are speaking about should it be seen as possibly legitimate planning devices right as opposed to exceptions as the way we see it now right so that's that. And finally, I think I already sort of post this. Uh, if the master planning regime in the as a law does not work, what are alternative modes of uh, or instruments of planning that we can think of, right? Um, and you know, what should we consider? I, I've kept all of these as open questions because you know the idea was to have an analytical framework and not a normative framework of how uh, planning should be. So I hope I could explain the the analytical basis on on how the planning law operates now. How it should be is, is something I'm, I'm keeping open for. So that's it. So uh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll end it. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for a very clear and, um, and comprehensive uh, presentation that raises um, very important questions. Uh, we now have time for um, discussion. And um, so I invite all participants to, you know, uh, raise their questions either in the chat box or by raising your hands. Um, okay, so we have uh, one question by um, London. Uh, let me see, how do I unmute you? Uh, well, London says, hi, Matthew, what do you think about the participation of people in wards committees? under the 74th uh, Amendment Act. Okay. Ananya can do that. Ananya, if you can go and unmute Nandan, please just look for him in the participant list and unmute him so he can oh, sure, sure. ask. You've been unmuted, Nandan. So Nanda, do you want to elaborate on your question or uh, should uh, Matthew answer now? Yes, uh, Matthew, my question was regarding the awards committee, you know, which are happening, uh, which are taking an incubation step in various parts of India. So how do you think that these participations of award committee will impact uh, the process of planning in India? If you can, if you could elaborate on this thing, please. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, should I take uh, should I take a few questions together, or should I go one by one? Uh, I think you can go ahead. Uh, let's see okay. how many questions we get later. Okay, yeah. sure, sure. Thanks. Uh, so, thanks. Uh, I think Nandan. I think uh, for the question. Yeah. So, I I did not uh, you know get into the questions around what committees and and their role. And if you look at it, just to be very clear, um, within the both the framework of the 74th Amendment, as well as how it's been used in various laws, uh, what committees are not seen, at least, you know, what it can be is a different question, but to start with, we should know how the law exists as it is, right? So what committees are not seen as planning sort of uh, institutions, I think, largely, you know, they're, they're seen, if you look at the functions that are mentioned in the, in the laws, uh, and of course the constitution is, uh, you know, uh, very, you know, uh, happily vague about the provisions that uh, the the powers that board committees should exercise. So it's 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 quite vague about what they can do. It is seen as mostly uh, a decent level. Uh, So what committees with the, with the planning framework really hasn't emerged much uh, either in the law 
or even you know uh, even in practice but i see you know there's been a lot of especially among uh, civil society groups there's been a lot of uh, engagement with how what communities can be part of it right there's been um, i know like in bangalore's case as well as in other parts of karnataka for example you see it happening where uh, there's, there's a demand to include uh, you know for a for a bottom up planning process uh, what communities is having a, a major role to play but honestly uh, as a spatial planning framework if you have a master planning regime it what committees i mean i'm just thinking as a you know for looking ahead i don't know how much they can they can play right, play a role right so for example if there are 200 or 250 wards uh, you know what is the nature of the you know exercise the participatory exercise that each 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 ward committee comes up with will it make a special plan of its own or will it give inputs um, if you look at the planning law frameworks, there's no provision for them to participate in a formal, informal, anything way. So everything, everybody has to go through the regular route that any other citizen might might uh, engage in. So, uh, so yeah, presently there is no real framework where uh, what committees are, uh, you know, forget about the, the within the framework what we have is not operationalized in most cities. So that's one reality. But beyond that, beyond the ex the existing framework. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know how it can sort of because it's not tied in with 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 the with the planning process, and it's mostly for the the regular municipal governance uh, or the municipal issues. That's the way what companies have been envisioned, right? Uh, I would say mostly in the laws as well as how how it's 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 being played out. Right? If you go for any, I'm sure some of you might have been part of uh, board committee meetings. Board committee meetings are mostly uh, you know even in practice it's been about you know. Uh, you know this garbage getting you know uh, dumped here and how to how to tackle that and, and those sort of questions but obviously it can do more right of, of course there can be other ways to look at it so yeah i, I hope i sort of answered that respond to that question okay we have a question by nitya which is a kind of follow-up question so ananya can you uh unmute nitya i think we should take first nitya's question and then priyanka's and then uh, olga's nitya you want to ask your question Hi, hi, Matthew. This is Nitya. Um, so, in terms of participatory methods, what are your views on area sabhas? Is it better than what committee? Yeah. And should I take anything else? Yeah, because, yeah I yeah. think it would be interesting to have Priyanka's question because uh, I think it's yeah. related. Priyanka? Okay. Hello, hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Matthew. Um, so while we talked a lot about how India lacks provision for public participation planning, right? I wanted to get some sense of what would you consider a good global example where we see very good decentralized uh, participation in terms of planning. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps, Matthew, you can take these two. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Now? So yeah, I, I'll take it together. So I think it's uh, connected with. So I think Nandan's question, Nitya's, as well as I think. Uh, Priyanka, I think it's all linked with the participatory participation question. The area subhas, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, there's there's no provision for area subhas in a in the constitution framework uh, in the seventy fourth amendment. There's nothing called an area subhas. So if you look at it, there's a very interesting you know division there. For seventy third amendment, you have something called gram subhas, which are a, a group of all the members of, of of the village. You don't have an equivalent for that, you know, in the seventy fourth. So what? What we have is something that emerged as a mandatory reform that came as a part of JNNURM uh, to pass what is called the Model Nagaraj Bill. And that's how Area Sabhas as an institution sort of was envisioned. Most states have passed. Most states have passed laws for you know uh, adding uh, Area Sabhas into the mix, but um, but these have not really translated much because uh, those laws were passed only to get funds for JNNURM. Nobody really wanted area suburbs to be constituted. Now, on the question of whether area suburbs might be better, I mean, firstly, I, I, you know, we, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see how it plays out. We don't have enough examples of area suburb functioning to really uh, intuitively, as on a principle level, yes, it sounds good. It should possibly work better because it's at a much lower level. For example, it's a polling booth level or a group of polling booths as opposed to a ward. In big cities, what tend to be much bigger. So principally, yes, it should ideally work better. But in terms of practice, unless we have enough cases, there have few cases where Mohalla Sabhas have been created in, in certain parts, or, you know, say, in, you know, in India, but otherwise not much, right? So uh, it will be hard 
for, for us to really state whether that's better. Uh, but I would just say that it's not a question of better, whether it's a question of process. And I, I do feel that in the planning process, none of these, what come these areas of us, none of them are there in the picture at all. So if you're thinking of a different planning regime, I'm not sure if it should be, should ne necessarily mention areas of us, but the idea of, of some forms of decentralized planning regimes is, is what I'm, I'm thinking of more than sticking with the area sub award committee kind of mode because uh, you know the logics for uh, for what what are now called as a, the idea of a local area planning regime that is uh, often different from uh, from the kind of uh, questions that we see in terms of uh, you know uh, area sub and board committees and, and that that mode uh, that exists and in terms of global practices i mean there are many i, I you know I, I i'm not a big fan of best practices and you know uh, putting that uh, you know in the context of india i've not seen much myself so obviously the examples from latin america is what uh, we, we should definitely look at you know uh, there's been a lot of writing around you know uh, participatory processes and participatory budgeting processes in Porto Alegre you know there's been a lot of writing in, in on so brazil is obviously something to look at colombia if you see has been you know has uh, a lot of interesting sort of participatory processes that have been there um, you know even you know this, uh, country like ecuador for example has the right to the city you know there in its in its uh, in its constitution South Africa also, you have some processes uh, not as participatory as possibly Brazil and stuff, but uh, it's planning. Uh, so the capital investment planning processes, all of them uh, have some participatory elements in it. And also, if you look at how the courts have functioned there, they have asked in many cases for a, a negotiated and uh, you know agreement and negotiated uh, participation. The courts have played a role in it. In India, we've not seen it much. There've been one of you know sort of couple of one-off cases, but not much of it. So, so obviously, I'm mostly giving examples only from the global south because I think you know that's what we can possibly learn from. But, but again, no, no one single best best practices, but obviously uh, some of the Latin American context and some of the South African sort of context might be things to uh, learn from and pick up from. So, so that's that's that. I think maybe okay. a few more questions. Yeah, Olga had a question about uh, sources uh, for your research. Olga, do you want to ask your question? Right. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yes, I actually, uh, yes, I would like uh, to get an insight. Right. Uh, in yeah. the process, but I also have another question for which I uh, raised my hand. So first of all, I'm sorry I've missed the beginning because I miscalculated the time difference. I'm abroad and this half an hour in India always, you know, <laughs> uh, mixes up me up a little bit. Uh, the question I have is that I lived in India, in Delhi specifically, uh, for a long time. And uh, I'm quite surprised that sometimes even when people uh, come together and oppose certain urban projects, like it's happened with Central Vista, uh, the government can still ignore it and just go its own way. So I just want to understand a little bit of your insights uh, how is it possible that even uh, when people put a strong stance on something that the government can allow itself to not take it into consideration? And uh, as per my understanding, specifically in Central Vista, even certain uh, parts of the official process uh, were not respected. For example, you have to have public consultations and... Uh, they were not including what uh, people voiced out. So could you please give me a bit of an insight because that's something I still struggle to understand. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very quickly on the source, this is the housing and land uh, rights networks. Uh, uh, you know, they have a usually a yearly uh, report. So this 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 is a 2022-23 report that has data up to 2021. So the data that I put out is from the 2022-23 report. Uh, okay. housing and land rights networks uh, i forgot the title of the report it's evictions in india or something like that which which actually uh, puts out all the evictions that are at play and on on the question of uh, you know on on central vista and how it's uh, obviously that's been a highly uh, again uh, the courts have been used very strongly uh, in in that case to to you know challenge and and tackle the kind of uh, uh, project that was carried out now the, the the part about public participation and lack of consultation and stuff, I would say, you know, what sort of did not work in the favor of the people who are opposing it, you know, purely from a 
I'm not saying what, what it should have been, right? That participatory mandates were there, but it was not followed. It is from a, I mean, just wearing my legal hat, right? I feel that, uh, you know, the, the grounds to say that, you know, it's the, the public participation processes, uh, you know, the, the nature of those, at least in, 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 the, in the law as it exists, as it exists now, um, the government was able to say that they followed the process. That is because of the because the nature of the the, the the mandate for participation in the planning laws are, are very low, and and the kind of uh, mandate for participation and public engagement that was expected and that was demanded was not followed. And, and there was an attempt to sort of, because I'm familiar with the petition that was filed and the lawyer who was actually arguing for the, in that case, um, if you, if you look at that, uh, you, you know, the, there was an attempt to sort of, and the Supreme Court also played a role to rethink the nature of should, you know, all, all major projects follow a participatory scheme and, you know, and then there was this whole debate around is India a representative democracy versus a deliberative democracy, you know, so we got into all those questions because, you know, uh, because the, the the present regime, present planning regime actually doesn't, or any kind of project based regimes don't have much of, uh, you know, uh, much of participation or uh, much of consultation consultation requirements. Hence, you're able to get away with it, which is why I feel, hey, possibly we can have a uh, we can include this in, you know, in, in a more uh, robust way, which will allow these, these, you know, these questions to, uh, to be addressed uh, better, you know. So I think a lot of other questions also coming in. So I don't know what's the order. Uh, Stephanie, you help me out. Yeah, I think we're going to uh, listen now to Amba Zagan and Shahana. Uh, please, can you um, ask your questions um, directly, but please make it short because time is flying. It's already 4.53. So Amba Zagan. You have to unmute. Um, Anania, can you unmute uh, uh, Anbaz again? I have unmuted Anbaz again. Okay, then if uh, Sharana is ready to ask uh, her question. Okay, I think I will read, uh, yeah, Sharana. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, so thanks so much, Matthew. Um, I, I really liked how you were trying to uh, use a new and, and I think very in, uh, an analytical framework that can be very insightful and, and bring a lot of new uh, clarity, I think, to how we understand urban planning and its outcomes in India. I had a few suggestions on that. Um, I, I thought the whole the using ideologies in the framework was excellent. Um, I, I think you can really bring in your analysis into those frameworks. And what you can do, as you mentioned, that's a UK framework. What you can do is actually use this empirical exercise to develop and strengthen these frameworks for Indian and maybe other sorts of contexts, right? right? Where on the one hand, there's the whole issue of colonial and then the post-colonial developmental sort of ideology that comes in. Um, and then the second thing that you can do, I think, with this is to situate it in somewhere in the larger framework of, of laws and institutions, because planning itself um, or what is considered planning, like the master plan, it's not all that significant. In, in some ways, many of the important questions of planning are not dealt with just through the master plan. And in some ways, participating in it may actually be irrelevant to many people whose homes are affected because it's not the master plan that's causing it, it's something else. Um, and, and, and what you could do, I think, in that, say, you know, one, maybe even incorporate what you're talking about in these new directions in terms of a certain kind of nationalistic ideology, a civilizational ideology that's coming in. But the other thing is to actually explore the issue of participation and democracy in a deeper way without just focusing on the master plan but say a broader set somehow, and, and that goes back to the question that I wrote, which is what, you know, what is planning in India, right? How do, how do our lawmakers conceptualize it? How do you conceptualize it? How is it theorized? And how do, what is it for the people who are actually participating in trying to make changes? Um, so in many cases, things that are relevant to planning, say like these new bus routes, free bus routes for people and things, they don't have much to do with what is included in planning framework. So a lot of what, 
people may consider planning is happening outside them. And maybe you can start to think of, say, within that, how much, say, participation is there, how much public ideology, uh, public interest is there, how much uh, democracy is there, and, and really get to some of these core questions within India about, oh, you know, what's the direction of democracy, participation, all of those things. Um, uh, but, but thanks for this. I really, like, appreciate that ideology framework of analyzing planning. Yeah, Matthew? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shana. I think a very useful suggestions, actually, as I said, you know, uh, all suggestions are useful, especially since I'm thinking of framing a paper around around this. So, so I think, yeah, I think it's useful to possibly look at the development planning framework. Uh, look at, if you look at, you know, if you look at the uh, recent works on planning, there's a, you know, interesting book, of course, uh, by Nicole Menon on, on, on planning democracy, you know, that's come out. So, which is always about the, the larger nationalist, you know, planning and the five-year plans and all of that emerged. So whether we can look at uh, these questions within that frame, I'm, I'm not decided to, to adopt that. I'm just thinking it's a possible way to to reconceptualize uh, ways of and ways of understanding how how planning operates. And and the other point about master plan and uh, looking at planning laws and, and as a frame of planning beyond the master plan, I think it's it's really important. And I think I I I, I of course in this paper and in this sort of uh, talk, I I tend I tended to obviously. Uh, or what do you call uh, uh, reify sorts reify the master plan of sorts uh, than it should possibly uh, but uh, it's it, 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 it's important to possibly look at other other ways in which it operates right and not to uh, situate uh, purely uh, as the master planning regime which is why I was thinking even if you look at the the since the master plan is not followed man and, and there's through other means people actually make sense of the city the the regularization process itself as i've sort of suggested or you know uh, it was a sort of a leading question i had in the end you know uh, was, was that can we actually view these processes also as, as legitimate planning exercises as opposed to what is seen as legitimate planning exercises under the town and country planning law you know regime can we see other ways of engaging with the state the these bikata claims you know which are by the way the bikata that form i indicated that is a that is a bureaucratic instrument, not a legal instrument. Yeah. So, so can we view all of these also as ways of, of you know, of, of, of an exercise of engaging with the with the planning, uh, you know, regime of, of sorts. So, so yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I, you know, yeah, thanks, you. okay. And then we have a question by Parto who says that he doesn't need to be unmuted. So I'm going to read the question quickly. And as usual, it's a long and complex question in three parts. So uh, A, what drives this informality, specifically the lack of formal land provision, zoning for housing, which then leads to growth of housing in areas that are not zoned for housing in the plan? B, could you elaborate a bit more on the issue of informality and work? C, even in the US, there is substantial local input into planning decisions, for instance, rezoning. So is it your contention that the lack of participatory input into the situation in India is due to preeminence of private property in India, or is it due to the arrogance of the state? Yeah, thanks. I think thanks, Partha, for the question. Very, uh, I mean, questions rather. Uh, all, all of it very interesting. I, I, I doubt if I'll be able to respond uh, uh, you know, positively to all of them, you know, you know, uh, you know, in three minutes, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So very, very quickly, the first one, I think it's a very broader question. You know, it's much beyond the scope of my engagement around, you know, uh, I'm coming here still as a lawyer and trying to understand what the, you know, what the regimes operate and what it means. And, and the reason for it, obviously it's needs uh, maybe uh, an economist like you to look into it uh, more carefully. But I would say that there is obviously, uh, uh, if you look at the allocation, I mean, this is more, it's not based on any empirical work. So it's, it's possibly a, a quick uh, you know, look into what might be driving it. If you look at the reservation of land for public purposes uh, or, or reservation of land for housing projects, there's hardly any, right? Uh, there's not much of that happening. So obviously there seems to be a gap there and it could very well be uh, based on that. But again, it's an empirical question which needs to be examined empirically. On, on the question of informality and work, I would say that, you know, uh, very quickly, this is again in, in the context of the kind of uh, work I was looking at in the context of the Vigo project. So uh, if you look at it, uh, the, the, the recognition of informal work 
and spaces for informal work, uh, you know, in, in the planning processes is something that uh, presently the planning regimes don't seem, seem to do, but it's something that can very well uh, be adopted. And interestingly enough, it is, in, as I said, in the volume one, which lays out the vision, much of these ideas are coming in, right? Uh, that, you know, uh, uh, much of uh, the city is, is, is you know engaged in informal informal work hence it should be addressed but when it comes to the translation of this on the ground through the development control norms it's it is still restricted so for example there are norms about where you can situate uh, an informal se sector unit now that norm for where you can situate it is based on an understanding the, uh, where, which says that if there are so many other buildings, commercial buildings, then you can have one informal sector now, which basically prioritizes and privileges the formal uh, sort of uh, work and formal structure, formal economy to the informal, right? So, so that sort of privileging still exists, and that's the that was the kind of uh, thing I was trying to aim at. The last question on 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 the, I mean, it's sort of limit connected with the first question, so. On, on the private property and, and the question of, of, of getting the inputs in. Uh, I, I, I guess so. I guess um, um, it's not pure, but I wouldn't call this as emerging because of the preeminence of private property in India. Um, but, uh, you know, possibly the, the absence of those, those feedback loops that exist, right? So it's not necessarily because of uh, any... Uh, you know, the, because the ideology of private property is over, you know, over and above that what we see in other parts. The ideology of private property, at least in my view, if you look at going back to the ideology sort of framework, it's not driven by the ideology of private property. It's not extremely strong uh, that what we have in India. And uh, the eminent domain idea, which is the ideology of public interest, seems to have a much low, a larger role to play. So in that way, it's probably not driven by that. But uh, but yeah, I think there are, there are some connections to explore, but more in terms of how how the how the how the public authority is able to uh, incorporate those those demands that that come from below and the channels that presently don't exist in law but exist outside the law and is done through these various other ways. So I mean yes, yeah, so that's how I, I can respond to to the questions. So Pata, you have a follow up question. Do you want to ask it yourself? Okay. Yeah, you're still mute. Pato. Yeah, and I think I'll just respond maybe, you know. Okay. So I see the question. So yeah, uh, I, this is a question about whether formalization is is more urgent. I, I don't know. I'm I'm not saying that formalization is 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 a way to go. I uh, I mean at you know the I mean I'm not a you know, person who works very closely with how uh, this should be done, but I can just say that there, you know, there can be stages by which uh, this can be carried out. Not like, okay, let us, you know, just formalize that space in a, in a, you know, in, in a, in a one-off way of sorts. It's obviously goes beyond street vending and others. So the, the question is, even if it's informal, how do you still, you know, allow it to have a space? Even if uh, something is, uh, whether it's work, whether it's housing, even uh, sort of, uh, even if it does not meet the formal criteria, in many ways, how do you still engage? The formalization can happen parallel, is my view. You know, as if, if you're engaging with this question in a, in a planning regime, the way I see it is whether whether it is formalized or informalized is is possibly uh, you know not something we need to worry about. That that should also happen parallelly, I believe. Uh, and obviously, people who are working there closely uh, in the sector will have a better answer about uh, how that should be done. But my only take is whether it is formal or informal, the nature of engagement for that, the nature of protections that are needed for, uh, for, for those workers as well as informal housing, uh, uh, beyond the question of formalizing, it needs protection. And those protections should emerge irrespective of the formal informal uh, status that, that uh, these, uh, these enterprises and these uh, houses and other special claims have. Okay, um, since it's uh, five past five already, I'll take the liberty to ask the last question. I have many, but I'll stick to just one. Uh, Masu, I think you have, you know, very convincingly shown that there is, um, I mean, confirmed 
that there is a lot of resistance to participation um, in India. Participation does make life complicated for both bureaucrats and, and elected representatives. We know that. And so participation from below so far has been defined in a way that is very low on Einstein's ladder of participation, right? I want to ask you about what could, could be called perhaps participation from above. And by that, I mean, who is involved in the planning process uh, today? Um, I'm speaking of experts, and I'm asking you because you are a specialist of public law as an academic, but also as a consultant. You have been uh, involved in drafting municipal laws in Bangalore. So do you have a feeling that, um, that the drafting process, perhaps today, involves a, a larger diversity of people, of profiles, than, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago? Um, I, I don't know if you're in a position to ask this question, but I would really like to know whether at the drafting stage, uh, more, you know, more diverse people, more diverse type of uh, you know, expertise are involved in, in, in drafting uh, the laws um, of the cities. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Very, very interesting question. Uh, also connects with your work. Uh, I think you know, yeah. I think it's it's if you if you look at it, it what we see now in the in the planning process is, uh, you know, uh, not many spaces for participation from below. Spaces for participation from below being created, right? Sort of invented spaces of sorts, you know, using your your own sort of work, right? It's being created through through uh, you know regimes and processes. Uh, from the ground. But interestingly enough, some of those processes are also able to directly engage with the processes above and be part of the uh, of the drafting of whether it's a law or a planning document are, are, are being able, are getting an entry point. Now, so with the Delhi case, I think some of, I think many of you are in this room, I think I can see uh, Mukta and others have been part of the maybe delay campaign. They can obviously give a better sense of how they've actually been able to do both in some ways. That is engage with with people at, on the ground at one level and also engage with the participation from above at the NIUA and the DDS stage. Now, the way I see it, it's this obviously seems to be, I don't have a 20 year experience of looking at all these questions. I have a 10 year of, of looking at these questions. So, uh, you know, so, uh, but even empirically, if you look at it, there is there is a clear uh, sense of, of of widening of that engagement, not only at the at the at the confrontation stage, the participation from below stage, but even at the above stage. Um, um, but and that too also a possible, as you seem to suggest, a slight widening of the kind of uh, experts that are there. It is still there is still a privileging of certain kinds of expertise. I would believe, you know, so you know, slightly more positive. Is, uh, disciplines would be more, uh, you know, at uh, will be more listened to than possibly an anthropologist who wants to, you know, contribute something to the device. Based based on my own uh, limited experience here in Bangalore, uh, with some of the exercises, both the planning exercise as well as 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 an exercise to redraft the municipal law here. Uh, so there is obviously a privileging of certain forms of knowledge, which will always exist, I am sure. Uh, but there is at some level a widening of that that base at, at not in a what is a classic democratic bottom up sort of process but even at the top you know uh, even at sort of that those sort of uh, at the public uh, at, at the state level in the you know in these committees and in, in these sort of uh, formally as well as informally for example the way i engaged with it was uh, there was some sort of a informal engagement and and then there were a lot of other groups that were called in, and and those groups were quite wide in in its sort of orientation. So there is some level of of widening. There is some level of broadening, and some uh, sort of at some level maybe uh, uh, you know other disciplines and ideas coming in uh, with with certain ideas still being privileged over the others. But these I would still say are as you say it's participation from above. Uh, it it does not uh, you know uh, respond to the to the real need for participation from below and those forums uh, and the need for, for those forums exist uh, irrespective of the forums that people have been able to create and experts have been able to you know uh, plunge themselves in you know through networks and connections on at about right so so yeah so i i don't know if i was able to respond but yeah well i i would love to read you know a first hand account of uh, you know what it is to to contribute uh, yeah. to, to this kind of uh, drafting processes. So that's just a suggestion. 
I, I don't want to do that for this paper, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Yeah. That was uh, super interesting, and I think the liveliness of the discussion shows that uh, there are a lot of people still interested in participation, even though uh, our politicians uh, seem to think that this is out of fashion today. I, I find this a bit depressing, but um, know that the issue is very much um, alive, of course. So uh, thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you, everybody, for um, participating in this um, session of the um, Urban Workshop. Thanks. And, thanks, uh, Stephanie. And thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. OK. Bye-bye.